Hey people, welcome back to our biostatistics course. Thank you all for all the love you've shown so far. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Again, we'll encourage you to like, to share, to comment, and subscribe if you haven't yet. But we know you all, and we know that you've done that already, right? 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 Oh, if you haven't done so, please do. Uh, so if you don't know much about me, um, this is a resume, basically. You can also get a sense of it on uh, this video uh, where you see the description. So today we'll discuss hypothesis. And immediately I can see some excitement, you know, in the comment section. Like, oh, finally, we're getting some kind of data analysis. Well, we are working our way towards that. And, you know, like we said, we'll make sure that you, you all get that. So now that we've explained the different types of data, we've explained already the different types of models, we've started broaching the topic of these kinds of tests. Well, why do we run this, right? And what are we testing? Like, it's confusing. Why? What? How? Yeah, we'll be talking about it in this episode really quickly. So in science, what we're doing is we have a supposition, you know, a suspicion, which is usually based on some kind of, you know, intuition or for knowledge, something. We know something and we think it looks like it might be this way. So we make assumptions, we emit hypotheses, but then we need to test them. Now, to make sure that we are finding, you know, the right results, we have to ask those questions in a certain way. So it is really important that we all understand how to ask those questions. So first, how do we come up with a question? Well, if you think about it critically, um, every single day you're coming up with a hypothesis. Every day, every day you say, I believe, I think that this is happening. I I'm almost positive, I'm almost sure that this is happening. That is a hypothesis, right? Until you find definitive proof, you are emitting a hypothesis. Um, so when it could be a hypothesis, it could also be a question, right? Like, why is this happening? Why is this this way? Um, that is a question that could, you know, if you, have a, if you ask that question, you probably have your doubts about what, what, might be happening and why that may be happening. You have some kind of intuition about why that's happening. And so you can emit a hypothesis. So you're at a hospital, you see patients and you're like, oh, uh, there have been a lot of patients with hypertension this month. Like, well, why are they getting admitted? Could it be, oh, could it be linked to some kind of disease? Could it be linked to maybe the, the, the season or so? whatever it is, you're starting to emit hypothesis. So the first thing I want everyone to take out of your mind is hypothesis generation is actually very straightforward. And if you feel lost about generating hypothesis, then one of the easiest things you can do is start by reading the existing literature, read what people have already found, uh, find things that have already been described, and that may help you get answers to your questions and maybe refine your question. So generating a hypothesis per se is not an issue. What may be an issue is, is that relevant or novel, right? So novel doesn't mean that it has to be groundbreaking, like you win a Nobel Prize or something. It just means that it adds to literature. Maybe you're asking a question that has already been answered. So just try and read and get a sense of what has been asked and answered. And you can get a sense of future questions. And if you're still stuck, you can almost cheat you know you just read a recent article maybe even a systematic review go into the discussion and find out which are those areas of improvement that where can we improve in that field and you have hypothesis right what you need to study next and that's it and that's how you can get that so when we're talking about hypothesis generation we usually say something right we think this is happening because x y and z now when we say that now we need to formulate it in this way that um, reduces bias, 
right, towards what you believe. And the way to do that is to formulate the null. The null hypothesis tends to be negative. Like, mm, I don't I don't think so. Whatever you thought, the null is like, yeah, I don't think so. I, mm, nah, it's not happening. So say you said, back to our example, oh, there's so many hypertensive patients coming to the clinic this month. Uh, could it be there's a season? The null hypothesis would be like, I don't think so. Uh, there's many patients coming this month, you know, the past months, for example. So all in all, maybe uh, whether it's the season or not, it's no different. Like, no, there's no difference between the two. So that's the null. The null is always trying to prove that there's no difference. Uh, there's nothing like chill, very negative, right? And then the alternative is actually what you're thinking. Uh, what we're testing when we're running a test is actually the null. Although we're interested in alternative, we're testing the null. We're testing whether, you know, there's nothing. And the way to think about this is to very famous concept. Think about, you know, criminal justice. When someone is taken in front of a criminal court, they are assumed innocent onto proven guilty, right? So if no matter what you have, no matter the preponderance of evidence, until the court has decided that person is innocent. So that's the same thing. No matter what you think, you believe, you start with the no. And then the verdict in court is very similar to the verdict after you've tested your hypothesis. In court, you either have find someone guilty or not guilty. Be very careful. We said guilty or not guilty. We didn't say innocent. So when a court says, not guilty, it doesn't mean you're not innocent, it just means the evidence presented wasn't enough to decide on a guilty verdict. Ooh, yeah. So the words we use is, um, we either reject the null, right? Or we fail to reject the null. So those are two different conclusions. We either reject the null or we fail to reject the null. And we will usually give ourselves a certain threshold for making error, marginal error. We're like, uh, 5%. So that is the famous 0 0.05 of frequency statistics, which is five out of 100 or one out of every 20. So we say 5% is the limit is usually what is, but you can modify it obviously, but usually it's 5%. And so when we do that, we are setting a type one error level of about 5%, right? So, if you do a two by two matrix, you're looking at true positives, false positives, true negatives and false negatives, that two by two matrix for the two wrong results, which are the false positive and the false negatives, we get type one and type two errors. So what the false negative and the false positive will be, will be things that we want to reduce as much as possible. Uh, we do not want to get too many of those. So we want to reduce them as much as possible. However, um, they tend to influence one another. So there is a limit to how much you can reduce that. So uh, we will be trying, when we mention sampling, we will be trying to uh, reduce the, for example, the type one error by, you know, better defining a question, making sure that differences between the groups are really substantial, being able to increase the sample size and so on and so forth. So when you're testing the hypothesis, when a test comes out, when a statistical software spits out results, it's you need to understand what the null is and what the alternative is. I need to understand what having a p-value less than 0 0.05 is and greater than 0 0.05 is. So if it's less than 0 0.05, you can reject the null. If it's greater, you fail to reject the null, right? So that is what we're thinking and all here is a null hypothesis. And we've briefly mentioned errors. So this is what we'll be testing. If we're thinking about a bivariable test, which we'll be seeing in future videos, we'll be testing this. Uh, we'll be trying to better understand what's happening. So thank you so much for uh, you know following through this. Uh, we really encourage you like we did early on to like this video and previous videos. Uh, to share, to comment and subscribe. Uh, obviously, we realize that some of you may be new to the channel. So if you have um, any questions, definitely feel free to ask them. But I will definitely recommend to you that you watch our previous videos because 
we are building up on previous material. So if you feel lost, it's okay. Uh, you can definitely ask questions. We'll do our best to answer them. But rest assured that you probably have the answers in previous videos. Thank you so much, and we hope to see you next week.